Bordetella pertussis Microbiology Bordetella pertussis is a gram-negative cacobacillus, a strict human pathogen with no known animal or environmental reservoir. It colonizes the lower respiratory tract, which is its ecological niche. The organism is fastidious, surviving only a few hours in respiratory secretions and thus requiring special media for culture. These organisms are non-modal, non-lactose, non-glucose, fermenting aerobic bacteria. Pertussis, also known as whooping cough, is a highly contagious acute respiratory illness caused by Bordetella pertussis. Eight additional Bordetella species have been described. 1. Bordetella parapertussisu. 2. Bordetella parapertussisov, ovine adapted parapertussis. 3. Bordetella bronchoseptica. 4. Bordetella avium. 5. Bordetella hensii. 6. Bordetella holmesii. 7. Bordetella trematum. And 8. Bordetella petrii. Three of these species, Bordetella parapertussis, Bordetella bronchoseptica, and Bordetella holmesii, can cause respiratory illness in humans. Unvaccinated infants are at the highest risk of being infected, but children, elderly people, and immunocompromised patients are also at high risk for whooping cough. Unlike Bordetella pertussis, Bordetella homesii may also cause bacteremia. Asplenia is the most common risk factor, but other immunocompromising conditions have been reported. Virulence factors Virulence factors of Bordetella pertussis are pili, tracheocytotoxin, pertussis exotoxin A and B. Pertussis toxin is an AB5 type toxin that is composed of one catalytic subunit, the A subunit, and five membrane binding or transport subunits, the B pentamer. Pertussis toxin is assembled in the bacterial periplasm and exported by a type 4 secretion system. Following binding to a sialoglycoprotein host cell receptor, Pertussis toxin is endocytosed and trafficked to the Golgi apparatus in the endoplasmic reticulum. In the endoplasmic reticulum, the B pentamer binds to ATP and dissociates from the A subunit. The A subunit is then transported into the cytoplasm and traffics on exosomes to the cytoplasmic membrane, where it ADP ribosylates the alpha subunit of heterotrimeric G proteins. This modification alters the ability of G proteins to regulate multiple enzymes and pathways, including their inability to inhibit cyclic AMP camp formation. The overall result of these modifications is an initial suppression of inflammatory cytokine production and an inhibition of immune cell recruitment to the site of infection and leading to increasing secretion of water into trachea. Other virulence factors are adenylate toxin, dermal necrotic toxin, BRKA protein. It gives resistance to the organism. Now, after discussing the microbiological aspects, let's discuss in detail about pertussis or whooping cough. Incidence. Incidence is greatest in infants younger than one year, who are at the greatest risk of morbidity and mortality. In adolescents and adults, the infection may result in a protracted cough and is occasionally associated with substantial morbidity. The average incubation period for Bordetella pertussis is 7 to 10 days, with a range of 6 to 20 days. Transmission Pertussis is spread by respiratory droplets and can be transmitted by coughing, sneezing, or sharing breathing space for extended periods of time. The risk of transmission is greatest during the catarrhal stage. Clinical Manifestations the clinical presentation of pertussis may vary with age and immunity, from vaccination or previous natural infection. Clinical manifestations of pertussis in adolescents and adults are often less severe than in infants and children. As a result, prolonged cough may be the only symptom in adolescents and adults. Classical presentation The classic presentation of pertussis includes paroxysms of coughing and inspiratory whoop, <laughs> and 
and post-tussive vomiting. The classic presentation typically occurs as a primary infection in unvaccinated children younger than 10 years of age, but it also may occur in vaccinated children and adults. The clinical presentation and course of pertussis infection generally are less severe in children who have been vaccinated. Classic pertussis, the cough of 100 days, is divided into three stages. Catarrhal stage. The catarrhal stage presentation is similar to that of upper respiratory viral infection with mild cough and coryza. Fever is uncommon. If present, it is usually low grade. In contrast to that in a viral upper respiratory infection, the cough in pertussis gradually increases instead of improving and the coryza remains watery. The catarrhal stage generally lasts one to two weeks. Paroxysmal stage. During the paroxysmal stage, coughing spells increase in severity. The paroxysmal cough is distinctive, a long series of coughs between which there is little or no inspiratory effort. The child may gag, develop cyanosis, and appear to be struggling for breath. Sweating episodes may occur between paroxysms. Cough may be worse at night and can be triggered by the inhalation of steam, mist, or other respiratory irritants. Complications occur most frequently during the paroxysmal stage. The whoop or noise made by the forced inspiratory effort that follows the coughing attack is not always present. Post-tussive vomiting is moderately sensitive and specific for pertussis in children. It's more common in infants younger than 12 months than in older children. Paroxysmal stage may last for two to eight weeks. The coughing spells increase in frequency during the first one to two weeks, remain at the same intensity for two to three weeks, and decrease gradually thereafter. Convalescent stage. During the convalescent stage, the cough subsides over several weeks to months. Infection with Bordetella pertussis has been known to lead to death from respiratory failure, secondary to exhaustion, hypoxemia, and cyanosis. Ensuring a patent airway is most important while managing patients with infection. Note, the total duration of all three phases is typically about three months, but can last four months or longer. Diagnosis. Diagnosis of whooping cough can be clinical with a good history, physical examination, and basic laboratory findings. One such lab finding is leukocytosis. The predominant nonspecific laboratory indication of Bordetella pertussis infection is a leukocytosis resulting from lymphocytosis. The absolute lymphocyte count is often greater than or equal to 10,000 lymphocytes per microliter. Marked leukocytosis, for example, greater than 60,000 cells per microliter, has been associated with increased pertussis severity, including pertussis pneumonia and pulmonary hypertension. Clinical diagnosis is possible in patients with a cough lasting for more than or equal to two weeks and at least one of the following symptoms. Coughing paroxysms, whooping on inspiration, vomiting following coughing attack, apnea in infants. Laboratory test, culture or polymerase chain reaction, samples from deep nasopharyngeal aspiration or posterior nasopharyngeal swabs. Culture is the gold standard laboratory test for the diagnosis of pertussis. The sensitivity of culture declines after the first two weeks, but polymerase chain reaction remains useful for up to four weeks since it can detect non-viable organisms. The Centers for Disease Control and Prevention recommends the use of polymerase chain reaction together with culture for the diagnosis of pertussis. For symptoms less than two weeks, preferred test is polymerase chain reaction and culture. For symptoms two to four weeks, the preferred test is a polymerase chain reaction. For symptoms greater than four weeks, preferred test is serology. Specimens must be collected by swab rather than the anterior nares or throat. Cotton tipped or rayon swabs should not be used for obtaining culture specimens as they contain fatty acids that are toxic to Bordetella pertussis. Instead, calcium alginate or polyester, such as Dacron swab with a flexible metal shaft should be used.
For polymerase chain reaction specimen collection, polyester or rayon swabs should be used. Recall that Bordetella pertussis thrives in the respiratory environment. Only special media, such as Bordet Jangu, which is supplemented with charcoal and horse blood, and Regan Low Agar, can optimize the growth of the bacterium outside the body. Culture on Bordet Jangu media shows bisected pearl appearance. Culture on Regan Low medium shows mercury drops appearance. Culture smear shows thumbprint appearance. Suspicion for pertussis is based on cough or potential exposure. If yes, look for an active outbreak or close contact with a person with confirmed pertussis. If yes, look for cough lasting for more than or equal to two weeks and absence of a more likely diagnosis. If yes, a clinical diagnosis of pertussis can be made. If no, test for pertussis, select an approach based on symptom duration, and evaluate for other causes based on clinical suspicion. If no active outbreak or close contact with a person with confirmed pertussis, look for compatible syndrome based upon greater than or equal to one of the following symptoms, paroxysmal coughing, inspiratory whoop, post-tussive emesis, prolonged cough without other explanation. If yes, test for pertussis, select an approach based on symptom duration. If no, pertussis is unlikely and evaluate for other causes based on patient's presentation. Complications. The most common complications of pertussis infection include apnea, pneumonia, and weight loss, secondary to feeding difficulties and post-tussive vomiting. These complications are more common in infants. Apnea occurs almost exclusively in infants, primarily those younger than six months. Histopathologic examination of respiratory tissue shows evidence of necrotizing bronchiolitis, intraalveolar hemorrhage, and fibrinous edema. Most deaths from pertussis occur in infants younger than six months of age, who are too young to have completed the primary series of pertussis vaccines. In adolescents and adults, the prolonged cough may result in substantial time lost from school or work, as well as social isolation, sleep deprivation, or anxiety about an undiagnosed condition. Treatment Isolation Standard precautions, as well as droplet precautions, mask within three feet, are recommended for children with pertussis who are admitted to the hospital. Supportive care Supportive care is the mainstay of management for Bordetella pertussis infection. Fluids and nutrition. Infants and children with frequent paroxysms of cough may have increased fluid and energy needs, which can be difficult to meet if the infant is coughing or vomiting. Therefore, intravenous hydration and nasogastric feeding may be required for some hospitalized patients. Antibiotic therapy. The macrolide antibiotics Erythromycin, azithromycin, and clarithromycin are the preferred antimicrobial therapies for the treatment of pertussis. Azithromycin is the recommended macrolide antibiotic in infants younger than one month of age. Trimethoprim sulfamethoxazole is an alternative for children older than two months who have a contraindication to or cannot tolerate macrolide agents or are infected with a strain that is macrolide resistant. The duration of therapy depends upon the agent and is recommended 5 days for azithromycin, 14 days for erythromycin, 7 days for clarithromycin, and 14 days for trimethoprim sulfamethoxazole. Prevention Because of the presence of the virulence factors already discussed, an acellular vaccine has been developed to prevent infection, which is given to most children. The diphtheria tetanus and acellular pertussis DTAP vaccine and the combined tetanus diphtheria and acellular pertussis TDAP booster for tetanus diphtheria and pertussis. The DTAP vaccine is meant to elicit immunity to diphtheria, tetanus, and pertussis infections. The vaccine consists of the diphtheria toxoid, tetanus toxoid, and various pertussis antigens, including pertussis toxin. It's a series of vaccines that children get starting from age two months and ending at age four to six years. The TDAP vaccine is a one-time booster, usually given at age 11 to 12 years and every 10 years thereafter. 
previously unvaccinated individuals. For adolescents up to 18 years old who have not been fully immunized with the DTAP vaccine, tetanus toxoid, reduced diphtheria toxoid, and a cellular pertussis vaccine, the TDAP vaccine should be given as the first dose of the catch-up series. Additional doses of tetanus and diphtheria toxoid containing vaccine and the interval of administration depend on the prior vaccination history. A single TDAP booster dose should be administered to adults older than 19 years who have not previously received TDAP vaccine after age 11 years, as recommended by the Advisory Committee on Immunization Practices. Here's an image of atypical lymphocytes in peripheral blood smear of child with pertussis. Here's an image of blood smear showing lymphocytosis of normal appearing lymphocytes as seen in pertussis and infectious lymphocytosis. Thanks for watching and see you next time.